So yesterday, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrapping up that big visit to China tonight. President Biden's hosting the Japanese Prime Minister at the White House. And earlier this morning, we spoke with U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, uh, and we talked about the issue of China. Here's what he had to say. I would say that be very clear also to the Chinese leaders. You want, US, you want international capital. You want actual business leaders investing and growing your economy. You cannot cheat and steal the way you did for the last 10 and 20 years to leadership. Can happen. Joining us right now is former SEC chairman and CNBC contributor Jay Clayton. Uh, you've testified uh, in front of uh, in front of the select committee before uh, on these issues. Can you be a friend of me in this environment? Is that too far? Well, we are. Right, we are frenemies right now. Janet Yellen is just returning from. Well, she's, telling, days. she's saying to them, "We need to be your friend," mm -hmm. and then we have a whole bunch of other people saying, "Actually, these people, folks are our enemies." Right, and I and I, and I want to be I want to be fair. I think they're both right. What Rahm Emanuel is saying, and I, I thought that was one of the most cogent and comprehensive discussions of where we stand with China that I've heard. I applaud him for it. Very honest, very candid uh, challenges, talked about coercion, talked about theft. Um, and, and he's saying, look, we need to reset the table. And Secretary Yellen is there saying, look, we need to reset the table, but we also need each other right now. No one, no one wants. Right. We've talked and about the this. question we keep asking is, can you really have? Everyone says, oh, we need to have both. We need to have both. But can you really do that? You know, if you tell me you hate me and yet you want to be my friend, it's very hard to actually think that could be true. Right. And the, and the, the question that we should be asking is, how do we get from where we are now, which is we continue to make a bunch of short term frenemy type decisions to a better place? And if that better place is a decoupling, or that better place is fair competition. I thought Ron made a very good point about some of the changes and the not just bilateral but trilateral kind of putting together a lattice work of, of powerful allies to stop and say no we're not going to go along with the way you're kind of dictating. Things. I, I thought it was a terrific explanation. He, he was basically saying that China has used economic coercion to continue to facilitate the status quo. You know, the, the way that they have been playing this competition game. He says, we need to combat coercion with coercion. We can't just expect, we, we, we have expected too long that they would change their tactics. And we've absent, been the more mature party for too long. And we have been the more mature party right. for too long. I thought it was a, a terrific explanation, which is now let's get a lattice work together. Let's use our own economic power of that group to say to China, if you want to be part of a global trade, a, gl a global fair competition, you have got to change. Okay, let's continue this on the TikTok front, since mm -hmm. that was what we were just talking about actually before the break. Where do you land at this point on TikTok? Is TikTok genuinely a national security threat? And is it a threat today, or is it a prospective, prospective threat in the future, and should there be a distinction? Look, I, I, I'm not qualified to say whether TikTok, what level of national security threat TikTok is. What do we know about media, um, uh, all, all sorts of access to a citizenry throughout history, that countries are appropriately worried that it will be manipulated. They are, we have, oh, look, we have the First Amendment. We take much more risk. Okay, but that's perspective, first of all. Right. Right, meaning what you're talking about is a perspective threat, not a current, this, I think this is an important No, no, no I, I'm saying even, right. to, even today, okay, because of the openness of our society, because of the open access to all sorts of you know, social media platforms, right. we run a risk of foreign influence. That's 100 percent true. No one can doubt that. The question you're asking is, is TikTok a more acute threat to national security than any of the other platforms and people's access? That's, that's I think, the question that people should be asking. If the answer is yes, and it's materially more acute, we have to do something about that. Okay, different question as we're talking about social media. Let's go to X mm -hmm. uh, and Elon Musk, someone mm -hmm. who you brought a case against, by the way, when you were uh, the head of the SEC. Uh, the Brazil judge has now opened an inquiry into Musk uh, after his refusal to block these uh, accounts uh, on X that he's saying uh, should be uh, allowed uh, under, under free speech laws that he believes are in truth in Brazil, uh, but he believes that the judge has made uh, the wrong decision. At the same time, he's also said uh, over the years that he would, uh, you know, comply with local laws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What say you? Well, let, let, let's go to the, the case at the SEC, which, which is fascinating, because 
What we did at the SEC, and people, people use this euphemism, the Twitter sitter, we said that when you're communicating with respect to um, Tesla right. and, and with, with your investors, we actually want a process in place to ensure that, you know, the information is accurate, fair, and complete like it should be when you're communicating. When we did that, I can say that I was actually, you know, I was a bit nervous because right there is free speech to the public. And we, the First Amendment is such an important thing in America. You know, but that's commercial speech. It was a time, place, and manner. And it wasn't a restriction on what he was saying. It right. was a restriction on process. You know, go to Brazil. What are they saying? They're saying, you know what? We don't want to hear those views. You have to block them. That's a, that's a, that's a big step. And I, I, you know, I think he's right to say, look, that's a very different place to be than an open forum. Okay, so one of the things that's fascinating about this, and Becky and I were talking about it just yesterday, is, you know, if this was taking place in China, and by the way, I applaud him on the, on the free speech stuff, yeah. uh, both here in the U.S. and to some degree, or maybe at a lot degree, in, in, in Brazil. But what's interesting is, is he able to do that because the business that he has in Brazil is not that big? Meaning, if this was China, or is the, or is the issue that Brazil has free speech, you know, it's supposed to be somewhat of a democracy, um, and that's just different than China, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't conflate these two types of issues. Um, you see what I mean? I see what you mean. And you know what? You probably gave or had one of the best interviews ever with him. I think you should ask him next time you talk to him whether he treats China different from Brazil. It's an interesting question. And, I, I and, and let, me, let, me a, let me make a point on this. Yep. We're having this issue right now in the United States. The Supreme Court just heard a case on whether social media platforms were unduly influenced by the executive branch and, and executive branch agencies. The questions from the justices were su such a good civics lesson because, of course, if you're in the White House, you're going to have Leo Brainer on. She's, got, she's going to pitch their view, wants journalists to pick up their view. I mean, that's, that's what I would say is di appropriate dialogue. Where does appropriate dialogue become a threat and coercion around speech on these platforms? We're going to be facing that issue for years to come.